how's it growing? Every time we have a hurricane approaching, we have social media garden groups blowing up with the same question, and that is, how do I prepare my garden for a hurricane? And this guy is going to answer that question in this episode. Tan Sovian is no stranger to Facebook garden groups, and we had some seed exchanges through the mail, and I'm excited to get to meet him. Dan Sovian not only Hazard worked for... Hazard reported ahead. <laughs> Hazard reported ahead. Uh, so not only did Dan work for a nas the National Weather Service, but he also has severe damage to his house by a Hurricane Ian. In part two, Dan will provide life-saving advice. In part three, you're going to want to hear his story and how he and his wife survived the hurricane and are still dealing with the devastating aftermath. So he's planting a grove or is it a food forest? Hey, Bo. It's a young grove he started with some food forest or agroforestry techniques, and he's open to trying new ideas. He's calling it Dangriculture. Ooh, I like it. So we're gonna get a Dangriculture garden tour, right? Yes, we're gonna get to see some highlights of the tour and stick around at the end of the video where Dan shares how amidst the chaos, Hurricane Ian actually brought not one, but two totally unexpected silver lining. Silver lining? Yeah, it's wild. Anyway, where were we? able to get access to the island within two weeks. After leaving my car at the apartment where Dan and his wife were living until they moved back to their home, the road going up to them. Dan and I headed over to the okay. island. Oh my gosh. I was astounded by the significant amount of damage nine months after Ian's impact on Florida's southwest coast. I retired from the National Weather Service. My goal was to have a, a small hobby farm, grow mangoes and other kind of tropical fruits. And lo and behold, uh, I get hit by a hurricane about a year and a half after we moved here. Did a lot of damage to the house, did a lot of damage to the trees. These all survived the storm. The one that was there did not survive. About what percentage would you say did you put in? I think I lost probably at least a third of my trees, maybe 40%. The most important thing you can do is if, if you are in a watch or warning situation, don't worry about your plants. Take care of yourself or your animals, of course, but yourself and your animals, get everything to safety and out of the way. The plants you can replant someday. Luckily, my damage wasn't quite so bad, but it was enough that I haven't been able to live here for the last nine months. Luckily, I topped those mangoes off about two months before and they, they still just fine. That's a Bailey's Marvel and that's a Hayden. Near the beginning of hurricane season, or shortly after you pick the fruit off your tree, prune the trees back. I mean, it's advice the University of Florida gives you. It's, it's just the smart thing to do because they, they won't topple if they're not just a big sale. I burn it, and I burn it, and I went out and got a couple metal barrels, and I put them up at a 45 degree angle, and I stuff the stuff in there, and it, and it burns in a low oxygen environment, and then it leaves behind charcoal. So all that carbon that was in the air that the tree took up, instead of like composting or whatever, I, it is now charcoal. It's going to be carbon in my ground for the next, for thousands of years. And I activate it, then I mix it into my compost, and then I mix that into my garden. So between that and uh, some chicken manure and alfalfa, that's all the, um, that's all the fertilizer I use. And you just, you put the weeds into the barrel, you let the rain go in and stuff. And, and what happens, at least around here, is the uh, soldier flies get down in there and they eat it all up. Oh. But I'm not really doing it for the, the compost so much. I'm doing it for the leachate. And I use okay. the leachate to water my banana trees and, and stuff like that. Now, it's, it hasn't rained out here in forever, so uh, there's not a whole lot of leachate. I eat for almost free because I never have to buy fertilizers because I have that. that but... But even if you don't do that, even, I mean, I understand not everybody's going to go out and make uh, biochar. Get a, um, you know, one of those grinders and make your own mulch. Throw that around and, and it won't last as long. It's not as good for the environment, but it's still good for the environment. And it'll, it'll provide tremendous amounts of nutrition to your soil, feeding all the life that's in the soil, especially in sandy soils like Florida, because the soil won't hold water or nutrients. The charcoal will. 
and the charcoal's not going away. It's going to be there for thousands of years. So when you water, it stays moist for a whole lot longer. It also will hold a lot more water. So if your property is prone to flooding, you'll have less of it. I don't know if it's going to make that huge of a difference, but you'll have less of it. Other people might not be as fanatical about carbon in the atmosphere and free foods as I am, but this is a ponderosa lemon. I have to, to put these things on here. Otherwise the crows uh, will come in and do that to okay. try to get the oil out. Boy, that's heavy. The worst case scenario, don't let the leaves go to waste. Let, you know, get the leaves off and use those, uh, the twigs. And even if you don't make charcoal out of it and you just throw it in a bonfire and have your kids out back and roast marshmallows or whatever, the ashes left over from that is just the best source of potassium you're going to find. And you can utilize that around your banana trees and stuff. Just be careful you don't you know, mess up your pH balance was, too much. But, but, but there, it's a great source of, of, uh, of potassium. So this black sapote is doing fantastic and did fantastic after the storm. I'm just looking. It looks like it has new growth coming out of it. It flowered, yeah. but the flowers fell off. Yeah, I see some blossoms here. Oh, you do? Yeah, two right on the Oh, you crowd. do? Yes, you do. <laughs> really, you should prepare before you even buy the property. But of course, most of us have already bought the property, and most of us never thought about, hey, what happens if there's a hurricane? There, there are some things you can do if you're on the coast and it's going to be a storm surge. You're, you're not going to be able to stop the water. But if it's freshwater flooding, you know, you can... You can Maybe dig trenches if your yard is big enough. If it's not big enough, you you could put in a French drain and to help the drainage uh, for the property. That type of thing will go miles to saving your trees. You know, the area right down by that palm tree there, it's, it's a low area. And the water from my roof used to drain down into there. And I had some jackfruit trees and they were getting flooded and they didn't like it. Uh, so I just ran a French drain along there to the culvert I have on the side. And lo and behold, it stopped flooding. It still got a little soupy out there, but I didn't have standing water in the ground. It's jackfruit. I got different kinds of papayas. That's going to be awesome when these are mature and pretty soon. Oh, yeah, this is going to look totally different out here. Yeah, I know. Prior to the storm, if you hear a storm is coming two weeks or a week or something, or it looks like a, a chance, you're not going to know exactly for sure. You, you can start working on some drainage type products. And and the other thing, the other issue would be with the wind. And, and again, if you hadn't already, if you have big trees and you haven't already pruned them, uh, the chances of them standing, if you've pruned them, are much, much higher than if you don't. And if you have big trees and they blow over, the chances of you standing them back up and getting to grow are very low. So it much less stress on the tree to prune it than to wait and see what happens. It makes sense for so many reasons, especially fruit trees, to keep them small. It's it's easier to, to pick. It's easier if something goes wrong to take care of the problems. Uh, the trees do much better because all the dead stuff is out of the way, and especially mangoes that hate nitrogen. If you can get that nitrogen out of there and, and get some of those limbs out of there, the trees fruit so much better and taste so much better. You should be thinking about those things now. Obviously, the pruning, you got to do it with the fruiting cycles on, on trees. But if, if it's not a fruit tree, the best time to do it is December, where it's nice and cool. I didn't get any storm surge here. I'm at 13 feet. The storm surge here was about 8 feet at the highest. But there was a, especially on my mango trees, they all had salt damage. I'm four blocks away from essentially the Gulf of Mexico. There's a couple little islands that are scattered out there between us and the Gulf of Mexico. And 150 mile an hour winds blowing across that for a couple hundred miles just picked up all this salt ocean spray and just blasted everything. And, and I will tell you, I know that because there was no roof where we're sitting right now. And 20 feet away were stainless steel appliances that when I got here two weeks later were covered in rust. I didn't even know they could rust. They were covered in rust. So tons of salt got into here. Yeah, among other people, I, I texted uh, um, Richard Campbell, who's a very famous mango grower down in Homestead. So I was asking him, you know, if he had any advice for, uh, uh, you know, what I could do for my trees. And, and his suggestion was to water them to get all the salt 
just drench the soils, um, which it, it would have been good advice, except I didn't have any water. But yeah, that's a lemon meringue. But you can see it was down to like a couple leaves. I'm like, oh man, and then all of a sudden, damn it. Huh. If it's a tree or any plant that's alive still, it's been stressed. It could have root damage. I, you know, a lot of these trees were leaning. I still have one that's leaning that I haven't picked up yet. Um, you know, you, you really don't know what it's been through. And, and uh, so you try to baby it a little bit. And just, but you don't want to make it too wet. But you want, but you want it moist. You want it consistently moist, but not wet as best you can, because typically hurricanes happen in the rainy season. Usually there's enough rain that you don't have to, you know, water them or anything, but you want to make sure that those trees, at least for the next year, are calm. The sugarloaf's doing great. The cherry's doing great. And I personally wouldn't fertilize them right away. You want them to like settle, you want the roots to get reestablished. You don't want a whole lot of foliar growth. You're going to have to deal with them not looking good okay. for a while. So that one is still the only one that really hasn't responded since the hurricane. I would wait a couple months at least. This one over here is a Nandok Mai. It's coming back above the grass, so, but it was struggling. The easiest way to straighten up a tree that's, if it's really big, I, I don't know, let's tell you, but if it, they're still small, even up to like, you know, eight to 10 feet or so, they did, um, they sold toe straps that are made out of cotton or real soft. And, uh, and, and they got loops on either side and you, you put the toe strap around it and you get ratchet straps onto a, uh, uh, a pole in the ground and just every week ratchet it up a little bit more. So just a, a little tiny bit, it, it, it pulls it back up straight. And, and that's the least stressful way to, uh, to, uh, to straighten up a tree. And it's, it's also, uh, the least stressful for your back. You're just doing a little ratchet there. So some of them, you're just going to have to, to make a decision to cut your losses. You know, you can always replant trees there. Are, in fact, it's a good thing to replant trees. Something, you know, sometimes it's good to take them out and put a new one in. Uh, so you get that, that fast growth again and. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. This is a, a dwarf jack called a cantaloupe. Oh, okay. The, so the storm didn't kill these, but it did kill a lot of your jackfruit. It killed all of the jackfruit except for this one over here, which was a seedling and it came back up from the roots. But then it died last week around the same time as that avocado tree up front. It was, it was dead. I was going to replant. And then it came back up from the roots and then it died again. So that was the only one that survived and, and obviously it didn't actually survive. That's another fig that did fine. One of the other interesting things that happened after this storm, I, I have no idea why, and it didn't just happen to me. Everybody around here was talking about it is, um, seeds blew in from everywhere. In fact, I was pretty good with my garden of keeping it weed free. And it's, it's impossible right now. There's so many weeds that just the seed bank is just full. After the storm, I didn't have a whole lot of time to plant things. I didn't plant any tomatoes. I had five different varieties of tomatoes growing in my yard. Beefsteak tomatoes, Roma tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, Everglades tomatoes. Just out of no, just came out of nowhere. It's a legume. You can tell by the flowers that it's a, 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 in the pea family. And it's native to the Caribbean, and it's invasive here. <laughs> but, um, but I never had them before. And they popped up, and I figured, well, they're probably fixing nitrogen, yeah. so I'll Might leave them well. there. Mm -hmm. The best I can tell is this, this, the storm destroyed a seed bank in Cuba, and they came across. I don't know what happened, but they're just plants that I've, I've never planted before in my life are, were growing on the property. And a lot of them were food plants that that um, I was able to get food from. I never planted a tomato. I had tons of tomatoes. The okra, again, even I put up this fence to keep the rabbits out, but there. This over here is Roselle. You know, the, the, the salt is not good for the trees, but by the same token, every mineral on the earth is in salt water because the land runs off into, into the oceans. So once the, 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 the salt was kind of washed out of the soil a bit, my garden, grew better than it ever has. 
it is just loaded with all kind of minerals and stuff. The fruit was so much sweeter and it was, it was really good. I've heard this before. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it's excellent. And I guess that's why people use fish emulsion and kelp and all that stuff, because it has all those minerals. I was looking for a Barbie pink guava. I couldn't find one anywhere. So I got that one up there. It's called a tropical pink. I got this one. It's the ruby red. And then finally, a couple of weeks ago, I found the Barbie pink. Then started making tea out of the leaves and I love the fruit. This thing has just been taking off since the hurricane. It's, it's had three flushes wow. of growth. Beautiful um, new growth. Yeah, no. It's funny when people post a picture like this and they go, what's wrong with my mango tree? I know. <laughs> like, nothing wrong with it. It's happy. No, it's going to die. <laughs> Bring it to me. <laughs> the papayas all died, but the moringa came back as moringa will. Just, you just take it easy. You take it one day at a time and you know what? Things eventually go back to as normal as they were before. I don't know how normal they were before, but things will eventually get back and you just keep on gardening. In the next episode of this series, we'll venture beyond the garden to delve into hurricane preparation in general and to hear Dan's life-saving advice. When it's published, you should see it here or a link in the description.